Hello, good evening, and welcome to another Christmas special. Ho, ho, ho. That was my Santa impression. Hope you liked it. Welcome to another episode of Brett's Old Time Radio Show, and welcome to my home here in the very Christmassy Lime Bay. Tomorrow, we are going for a little bit of a carol concert at our local church, and we'll be taking the boys with us. George always does a reading. And I'm planning on going in a little bit of a festive costume. So we will definitely be checking in and showing you around. Well, I'll definitely showing you the costume for sure. Look out on our social media. Thank you for joining me once again for our regular late night visit to those dusty studio archives of old time radio shows right here at my home on the south coast of the United Kingdom. We are literally a day away after tomorrow. It's all kicking off. It's Christmas Day. We're, it's Christmas Eve tomorrow. How is that possible? But it's a bit exciting, isn't it? I love Christmas. Absolutely love it. And having two young boys is great. And of course, we've got Lola in the family now. And she has got a lovely little Christmas stocking all to herself. So that should be good. I'm Brett. I'm your host for our Nighttime Podcast. Welcome to another episode. Do please check out our Facebook, Instagram or YouTube. They're all called Brett's Old Time Radio Show. If you could follow us, it would be just brilliant. Also, we've got a supporter page, patreon.com forward slash Brett's Old Time Radio Show. For now, it is an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and it's a bit of adventure, as always. This one's called The Carmen Kringle Matter, and it was first broadcast on the 22nd of December, 1957. Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. How's the weather in Palm Springs? A blonde in a bikini just melted past my poolside window. Goodbye now. Oh, don't hang up. Uh, Johnny, this job's just a few miles north of where you are. It'll take maybe a day to clear it up. Yeah, you said that last Christmas, Pat, and I got trapped in a blizzard. This season, I soak in the sun. Happy New Year. John, boy, we have a bonus list in this office. Your name could be on it. Uh, near where I am, huh? (laughs) It's a ghost town named Calico. An old prospector named Kringle is breathing his last up there. I thought old prospectors never died. He wants to change the beneficiary on a $50,000 policy, but a nephew, Ned Kringle, threatens suit if we let him. So you contact our agent, Gene Craig, in Barstow. Who's the new beneficiary? Uh, Carmen Kringle. Carmen? A burrow. A burrow? Yeah, uh, if I don't hear from you, Johnny, Merry Christmas. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Carmen Kringle matter. Expense account item one, $1.40. Telegram to Gene Craig and Barstow telling him where and when to meet me. Item two, $50 even to Al Sterner for his charter plane to the ghost town of Calico. The guidebook says there's something about desert country that's good for the soul. And in spite of the air bumps, I got a panoramic view of the great Mojave that took my breath away. The sun's setting rays hit the weird mineral straighters of the Calico Range and turned them into a patchwork of beauty. Night comes quickly in this country, and I turned to well when a Christmas tree cluster of blinking lights appeared under our wings. By way of answer, he put the plane into a glide and set us down on the smooth surface of a dry lake bed. You want me to wait around until your friend shows up? No, no, thanks. Well, there seems to be plenty of company. That's just an old coyote. Don't stand too long or you'll freeze to the spot. Okay. Good luck. Call me when you want to be picked up. I watched Al's plane until it was swallowed by the darkness. And suddenly I got that feeling in the hair on the back of my neck that I wasn't alone. The moon was up enough to make out shadows, and silhouetted in a circle around me was a strange collection of figures. One of the pack moved toward me, and for a crazy second, I thought I'd bumped into Santa Claus's reindeer. Then a car without lights came rushing at me. The headlights slammed on, and I got a glimpse of a donkey herd scattering into the night. All right. 
right, mister. Walk toward me, slow, with your hands high. I've learned never to argue with a Winchester 94, so I followed orders. I spotted the weaving headlamps of another car approaching and prayed it was the agent, Gene Craig. Close enough, sonny. I can pop the rattlers off a sidewind at 60 yards. So don't you make no sudden move. He was maybe 60 with gray sideburns and a frosty goatee. A marshal's badge was pinned to his leather jacket. All right, now, mister. Marshal, Marshal, that's all right. That's Mr. Dollar. Huh? I'm supposed to meet him earlier. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm Gene Craig. Huh? I you... couldn't get here until I drove Doc Spangler up to Chris. He's had another setback, Marshal. Yeah, uh, some darn fool let down a rail on his corral and Chris Kringle's whole herd got loose. He don't give a chuck for most of them, though, except Carmen. Now he's fretting because she's running wild. Almost had him tracked down when this year fella showed up. If you vouch for him, huh, Gene? Well, you are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Well, a uh, frozen facsimile. Come on, I'll drive you into Calico. You tell Chris that I'll have his Carmen back in the corral before the moon's full. And, uh, Gene. Yeah, my Tell the old sourdough to stay alive, will you? We need him around here. Sorry about mistaking you, Mr. Dollar. Jean Craig, with a J, knew her way around. She was strictly business and filled me in fast on the old prospector with the odd name and his desire to change the beneficiary of his policy. Everybody calls him Chris because every year he loads up his burrows with toys and presents for the miners and their families back in the hills. Uh-huh. The kids really think he is Santa Claus. I'm afraid it won't be a very merry one for them this year. Well, what makes everyone so sure Chris Kringle is giving up the ghost? Doc Spangler says there's nothing apparently wrong with him. It's more like he's given up. Oh, what's with this Scrooge character, the nephew? Ned Kringle seems all right. It's the man with him, Willie D'Agostino. He does the talking for Ned. You think he was going to inherit the money? Well, maybe he's expecting to. You know, you're making a good case for Carmen. Can a girl be a beneficiary, Johnny? <laughs> Chris can leave it to a three-minute schooner if he wants, providing a trust is set up. Could the people of Calico be that trust if they promise to take care of Carmen? Yeah, I guess so. Why? That's the way Chris wants it. That way, there'll always be a Christmas in Calico. <laughs> what happens when Carmen goes to donkey heaven? Or is it burrows that never die? There'll always be burrows in Calico, Johnny. And one of them... Could always be named Carmen. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle matter. Calico, once the richest silver city in the West. It was unbelievable. Like seeing a page from the past. Walter Knott, famed creator of Knott's Berry Farm and Western historian, had bought the old ghost town's battered remnants and restored it to the way it must have appeared in the wild and fevered days of the Silver Lord. I could make out signs nailed to weathered batten boards that told of a flourishing and colorful past. Joe's Saloon, the last chance, Hyena House Hotel. Lane's Mercantile, the Calico Prince. High on a hill at the edge of town, people were gathered at the entrance to a cave that was illuminated by hundreds of miners' lamps. Kind of gets you, huh? Almost like it was planned. They're rehearsing for the Christmas Eve pageant. Maybe you can spend Christmas Eve with us, Johnny. You don't have other plans. I have a day with a steam-heated swimming pool. What? Come on. Let's meet the old man. Expense account item three. A hundred bucks for a quart of perfume or a mink scarf. Anything to wipe the hurt look off of Jean Craig's face. She led me up the steps to the rickety porch of Chris Kringle's wooden shack. A tall figure carrying a black bag stepped toward us out of the shadows. Jeannie, I'm glad to see you. Will you drive me back to town? Why, certainly, Doc. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. Hi, son. Hi. Chris? Is he still all right? I couldn't say. Been sitting out here waiting for you. You haven't seen the patient? The medical man owes a duty and all that, but I'm too old to talk back to a gun. They wouldn't let you in? Tired of it. Well, I'm not a medical man. Well, please be careful, Johnny. 
I told you, Sawbones, stay away and leave the old man to... <laughs> well, if it ain't a little genie, the policy fixer. And who are you, mister? Willie D'Agostino, this is Johnny Dollar. He's from the insurance company to see about changing the policy. Who is it, Wally? Who are you talking Relax, to? Relax, will you, and let him give us some tourist directions back to Barstow. There'll be no policy changing at this late date, mister. Ned Kringle is very bereaved at the imminence of his uncle's demise. Just family admitted at this sad hour. So mosey along, folks. I'll leave the young man to his grave. Your foot is in the door, mister. I don't like your foot. And I don't like you. His hand moved to his shoulder holster, but Gene was standing right beside me. It was Doc who suddenly shouldered past Agostino and fled up the stairs that gave him my chance. I kicked the door wide. <laughs> threw him off balance. I shoved Gene aside, and that was a mistake because a million Christmas tree lights blazed up in my skull. <laughs> then slowly the tree lights faded away, and I saw Jeannie fussing over me and looking worried. A young, nice-looking fellow was seated next to a marble top table. D'Agostino leaned against the stone fireplace and dangled his gun, smiling like he had a stacked deck. He's all right, Doc? A nasty cut, but no fracture. I know how to pull my punches, Doc. The old man. How is he? No better, no worse. Just lying up there staring at the ceiling. I want to see Chris. I have a right to, Ned. I'm an old friend. Wooly, wouldn't it be okay if Gene just went no, up Oh, let him die in peace. He's past carrot who sees him. Wooly, these people have I a right. I said no. I'll get a hero boy and a speak and shove off. Go on. Come on, Johnny. Help me, Doc. How's it going to feel, Ned? Sharing blood money with a hoodlum. Your uncle paid for that policy with a pick and a shovel. It took a lot of years, a lot of sweat... And he's had your name on that policy ever since you were born. Oh, man, Kringle never saw pay dirt in his life. Ned had given money to live on, paid the premiums on his policy. Chris was always tapping the kid, claiming he had a new find. He was going to mine a million. Wait, shut up! The old man's dying. Tell him, Ned. Tell him how the old phony was always taking the bars, making like Santa Claus with the money you give him. Willie, haven't you got a... Tell him, hold on to the money! I know he's been waiting a long time for this. Me. Willie D'Agostino, that's who... Is that true, Ned? Yeah. I thought my uncle would make a strike someday. I I honestly thought he'd strike it rich. I know he tried. He did strike it rich, Ned. When he dies, every man, woman, and child in this town will mourn him. He'll live in their hearts. What will people remember about you, Mr. D'Agostino? All right, I'll get out. Get out and stay out before I... Really? This rifle will make a hole in your belly big enough to pass a borax beam through. So you just drop that gun. Well, I don't know what to shout at about, but you're guilty of carrying sidearm, you're threatening and violence, Mr. D'Agostino. And ain't nobody does that in Calico, as long as I'm the marshal. Now, you better get. Ed Nuller, I love you. So let Gladys hear that. <laughs> Well, I'll see how Chris is. Uh, Doc, yeah. tell the old buzzard that I got his Carmen back in the corral. Jingle bells and all. Yeah, nice work, Ed. Now, what's holding you, mister? Okay. Okay. All right, let's go, Ned. Uh, let the squares have a round, huh? I'm going to stay here, Willie. I want to be here when Chris... Hey, that's a good idea. That way, no fooling around with the will, huh? Smart kid, that Ned. Uh, see you at the funeral, huh? Go up now. You were wonderful, Marshal. And you too, Johnny. Oh, yeah, sure. I take a nice sock on the head. Say, you folks better come up too. Chris wants to say something. Oh, 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 say. I forget on this. The corral. Come on. Agostino must have had another gun in his car. One of the bullets had found the mark he intended. Willie Boy wasn't taking any chances that Carmen Kringle would inherit $50,000. We found the burrow lying on her side, quite dead. Jingle bells and all.
Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Oh, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle matter. Oh, Marshall. Johnny. How could he have been so cruel? Carmen dead. It's just not right. Yeah. I figured that Castino might be mean enough to try killing Chris's pet burro. We can't tell him about it. It would kill him for sure. You'll have to know the truth, Gene. You'll have to decide about the will. Yeah. Truth is always the best. And easy this time. Easy? Huh? Yeah. I'll just take these bells off and this poor little fella, and I'll put them where they belong. Carmen. What? Carmen. Oh. Mosey over here now. Oh. Well, you pull the switch. You put these bells on another book. Yeah. I didn't trust that greasy character, and I was right. A nice girl, Carmen. Oh, I'll be. Now, now, you folks go on up and see old Chris. I'll keep an eye on this here $50,000 jackass. That's uh, the way it's going to be, ain't it, Johnny? Yes, sir. That's the way it's going to be. But I was wrong. The roly-poly little old man in the four-poster bed with his white whiskers resting on the quilt changed his mind again. Even after hearing about how the marshal saved Carmen. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to scratch Ned's name off of that insurance, Mr. Dollar. I tried to shake that bag of Stino, figuring he'd take his hooks off of Ned. If he thought my Carmen was going to get the money. Oh, I was scared for a while that I just might have to up and die to square my nephew's gambling debts. I, uh, I'm sorry, Chris. I'll work my fingers raw paying every cent I owe, but I'll pay him back with interest. I want you around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, Chris. Hey, lift the lid on that footlocker and fetch me one of them bags in there. They're, they're pretty heavy, but you look strong. Well, they're <laughs> sure heavy enough. Kick out of stuff with silver? <laughs> it's better than silver. Open it up. Open it up there. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah, recognize that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you'd better have a good sleep, Chris. This here is plain old gravel. Oh, plain old gravel. It's uranium, Doc. Huh? The last batch assayed at $900 a ton. And I got a mountain of it staked out. In both our names, Ned. You oh, don't care. Hey, Why, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Mr. Dollar, if you and Jeannie check with the Barstow Bank... You'll find that they'll extend credit on the strength of that assay. <laughs> uh, you reckon you can spend two days buying enough presents so as we won't disappoint the folks hereabouts? Expense account item four, $68 even. Telephone calls to five principal cities where I thought Willie D'Agostino might be remembered. The police departments had a long list of reasons why they remembered Willie. That was my Christmas present to them. Expense account item five, another 50. Truck rental to haul the presents we bought for Ned to give away come Christmas morning. And then it was Christmas Eve. We sat on the Kringle's porch and watched the procession up to the Maggie Mine. The flickering lights from the miners' lamps reflecting on the faces of the happy children. Old Chris was bundled up in blankets, his little eyes twinkling, chuckling to himself like he knew all the answers of the universe. Jean was there, too. Kind of nice, isn't it, Johnny? Kind of nice. Marshal Ed Noller was one of the wise men in the procession. I recognized the sideburns. And Doc Spangler couldn't hide his height. Oh, he wore an awful beard. Ned Kringle led the burrow that carried the Blessed Mother. Yeah, you guessed it. The burrow was Carmen Kringle. Expense account total, including return to Palm Springs and incidentals, $229.75. But forget it, Pat. This is the best holiday I ever had. And I was only cold at the start. From all of us to all of you, may this be your very merriest Christmas ever. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our latest adventure with insurance investigator Johnny Dollar. And don't forget, very important, tomorrow 
we've got what I'm hoping is going to be a festive episode of The Saint with Simon Templer. That's going to be going live at 5pm GMT. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a supporter page at patreon.com forward slash Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Thanks for listening. And oh, happy Christmas. It's Christmas Eve tomorrow, so it's all kicking off. I can't wait. Really excited. Is that silly that I'm really old, but really excited? I think the kids make me excited, don't they? So we're really looking forward to Christmas. We've got all the family around for Christmas dinner, but I'll keep you guys well in the loop. And of course, there'll be lots of Christmassy check-ins for you to have a look at, see what's going on through our day. Thanks for listening. I'll be with you seven days a week, each and every week. And I'll see you tomorrow on Christmas Eve on Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Love you. Bye.